to today's Trainer Education Webcast, a crash course in effective teamwork hosted by HRDQ and presented by Mr. Gary Turner. Our webcast today will approximately last one hour. Do stay tuned at the conclusion of the broadcast for an exclusive offer. Now before we begin, there is a question and answer button located in the upper right hand corner of your screen. You can use this button during the webcast to submit any questions that you have. We'll either answer your questions as we receive them or during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation with Gary. If we run out of time, then we will absolutely email you a response to each of your questions after the session. My name is Sarah Montgomery and I will moderate today's webcast. I am in business development for HRDQ, a publisher of research-based training solutions that improve the performance of individuals, teams, and organizations. Today's presenter is Gary Turner. An award-winning trainer and HRDQ senior faculty member, Gary has over 30 years of professional experience with major corporations such as M&M Mars, Aramark, and AT&T. He has been a speaker at many worldwide meetings and conferences, including ASTD, the Association for Quality and Participation, the College and University Personnel Association, and the International Collaborative Organizations Conference. Gary earned his BA from Harding University. He also holds two master's degrees, one in communication from the University of Nebraska and another in history from Abilene Christian University. He did his PhD coursework at The Ohio State University. Among his awards and distinctions, Gary has been a final judge for the International Team Excellence Award, as well as a proud grandfather of his four grandchildren. We are very pleased to have Gary here today to talk about effective teamwork. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Gary. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's good to be here. I always enjoy talking about teamwork, and today especially I enjoy talking about a simulation that helps teams explore how they work together. And today's agenda, what we're going to look at, is we're going to look at how to explore the dynamics of teamwork using a classroom game. Now, we'll talk a lot about Jungle Escape, but the same dynamics of teamwork could be applied to many different types of games that some of the people out there listening into today might already be using. We're going to look at how to identify a team as one of three types of teams. We're going to look at nine indicators of team effectiveness. And also those indicators, if they're missing, uh, what could be done for a team to improve their own effectiveness. We're going to discuss some of the difference between project planning versus the implementation of a project and how a team might spend their planning time wisely in order to implement better. We're going to look at some action planning steps both individuals and teams can implement immediately after they do Jungle Escape. And then at the end, we'll answer any outstanding questions. So we're going to start with that first part, which are the dynamics of teamwork. The dynamics of teamwork when we do Jungle Escape uh, is basically introduced through using a little package that, uh, that basically has people put together parts to form a helicopter. And at the bottom uh, left-hand corner, you can see the helicopter that people end up building in this game. So uh, here's some of the, the dynamics that happen during this jungle escape game. We divide participants into teams of four to eight participants. And then each team is given a kit containing 97 pieces in order for them to make a helicopter. And they're given a black and white photograph of the helicopter to build. Each team then first plans how they're going to build this helicopter. And they talk about what they have to do to build it. And then the team has 30 minutes to assemble an airworthy helicopter, or a good quality helicopter, we say, before the monsoon hits. And so it adds a little bit of drama and a little bit of pressure to complete this within that 30 minutes. The action starts slowly, but it builds as teams become frantic to survive. And uh, I like to count down how much time is left in their building time. And you can often see when you get down to maybe 10 minutes left, all of a sudden teams become a little bit hysterical, wondering how in the world they're going to complete this helicopter in the final 10 minutes. So that's an overview of what happens uh, to create this exercise. Now we create this scenario in the gameplay. And the scenario is that everyone imagines they've crash landed in a jungle 
while on a mission to deliver helicopter parts to a secret military base. And unfortunately, because of where they landed, the chances of being relocated and rescued are minimal. And it's especially threatening since the monsoon is going to hit in 30 minutes. So the crew has managed to salvage the helicopter parts in the back of the plane. And they may be able to construct an escape chopper. Now the fun part of this uh, setup, as you can see down at the bottom of the screen, there is a video scenario that uh, we play at the beginning, which kind of illustrates some of what has happened here and adds to the excitement and realism of the game. Now, the ground rules that a team is given uh, are, are set in place to help put a little bit of constraint on the team being able to, to do this effectively. And so five ground rules are laid out here. Is the team can take whatever time they want to plan this assembly. Uh, but most teams are pretty antsy to begin building it. Uh, they're also told they can't exchange, put together, or organize pieces until the assembly time starts. So they're, they're wanting to get their hands on and, and usually start the game. And then they tell the observer or the facilitator or someone when they're ready to begin the assembly. That's in order to capture how much time they actually spent planning. And then only one person at a time may go up and look at a model that we put up in the front of the room. We hide a model. Uh, and they can walk up and look at this model. And then they go back to report back to the team what they've seen about how to build this helicopter. Then they bring the helicopter to the facilitator for final inspection. And these uh, ground rules then help facilitate the game, but also help restrict what a team can do in order to build a helicopter. Now, uh, the pictures on the following pages so, sort of show how exciting it becomes as, as teams work frantically to try to figure out what to do. In the beginning of the game, what you'll see in some of these pictures here is people are trying to figure out how these pieces go together and what they have to do to build a helicopter. The picture of the helicopter is in the center of, uh, of these four teams here. And that picture is what they get to see as they, uh, they work through the game. Now what happens, also they have a phenomenon I call everyone standing. And at the beginning, they're sitting. But as the excitement builds, everyone by the end of the game is standing, trying to complete this helicopter as quickly as they can. Now, at the end, we congratulate them, give them a round of applause for their helicopter being airworthy. And we examine right away what their team's planning time and assembly time was. And we get an idea about that because uh, one of the things that this uh, exercise will, will illustrate is that good quality planning leads to a lower assembly time. Most teams, though, are those ready, fire, aim teams that quickly want to start building the helicopter and don't spend the quality time planning that they need to do. Now, there are three types of teams. The first type of team we call a fragmented team. A fragmented team often has one autocratic leader or a person in charge, and the team is somewhat fragmented because there are different ideas about what ought to be done. But uh, because they're following one leader, they fragment into a couple points of view, or they, they fragment into working apart from each other. And you see this in Jungle Escape when they start, because one team, uh, if you have a team, one person will begin working on the rotor, and, and another person will work on the tail section, and another person will work on the landing gear, and they all work kind of independently and fragmented, and when it comes to putting all the pieces together, they start having some struggles. A divergent team, secondly, is a team that discusses a lot but doesn't seem to make any progress. They have different points of view. They are not reaching consensus. And it's frustrating for the team to figure out what we really ought to be doing. Third type of team is a cohesive team. And a cohesive team is able to work together and actually effectively build the helicopter. And you see cohesion particularly because People are interacting quite well. And they're interacting a lot, talking to each other about what they're doing and what they need to do. So we're going to look a little more in depth at these three types of teams 
So you can apply this to any type of training that you do. And uh, you might want to even apply it to teams you see in your work site. The first type of team we'll look at is a fragmented team. Some of the indicators we, we see are autocratic leadership. For instance, at the beginning of the, the game, there's often one person that's doing all the talking. And he's saying, hey, Sam, you do this. Uh, Jill, you do that. And he's just kind of barking out directions for the team. And to some extent, that feels good because teams want to know, well, what should I do? And there's a lot of confusion at the beginning of it. So when this autocratic leadership happens, the team makes very quick decisions. They don't spend much time or effort looking at alternative strategies. And there is a lack of participation by maybe all, at least some, of the team members uh, because people are sitting there just letting others kind of take charge. Uh, and so one person or a minority of a couple people make the vital team decisions for the team, and the team sits back and allows that to happen. Conflict or disagreement is suppressed or ignored. Uh, I'll sometimes hear at the end of the game uh, someone say, well, I didn't think we should do it that way. And when you ask them, well, did you voice that? Uh, they said, well, no, I didn't want to speak up and say anything. And so disagreement is just kind of uh, uh, ignored on the part of the team members. And some team members feel good about the project, but others do not. And so a couple people may feel very good about where they're heading, but others don't feel that. And you could all probably visualize in the workplace these type of teams. Uh, maybe you've even worked in this type of a team where you felt like the team was not really working well together. And it's sometimes hard when you're in the middle of a team like that to put your finger on, well, what's the reason for it? These are some of the reasons right here. These are both reasons for it and their effects of it. And so these are the indicators, uh, the keystones of, of a fragmented team. Let's go on, uh, Sarah, and look at a uh, divergent team. A divergent team has passive leadership. That is, no one really autocratically takes charge. But, uh, but uh, the leaders that are trying to take charge don't exert themselves very well. And so there's a, there often happens because there's a lot of very cautious problem solving and decision making. And we become overly cautious in this type of a team. And we spend too much time planning. And it leaves less time for implementation. Often the planning is not very in-depth planning. And it's uh, often very superficial planning. Uh, the team is unable to reach consensus or hit upon an idea that everyone can latch onto. And they often get to a point where they use voting procedures to resolve their issues. Sometimes I'll see in Jungle Escape, we've been, we've been into the game maybe five minutes, and, uh, and something's happening, and someone says, well, how many think we ought to do this? And you'll see a couple of hands go up. Uh, that says that team isn't willing yet to kind of vocalize and reach consensus yet, but they're, they're still a divergent team. There's often little commitment or less commitment to the plan or final project by team members. And many of the team members are often dissatisfied with the team's effort or not feeling like the effort being put in is really going to achieve the results that they really want. And so in Jungle Escape, what you'll see in a divergent team is a team that is feeling a lot of frustration early on in the exercise uh, and not feeling like there's, there's very good harmony here. Uh, and, and so in the divergent team also, not only will you see this early on frustration set in on a team, but what you'll see is people not uh, talking to each other but not really dealing with the issues well of what they have to do. Uh, let's go on to look at a cohesive team now. And what we'll see is balance in the planning and implementation phases. And what we'll see in the planning is a little more in-depth planning or at least planning that people feel has some value to it. There is a cooperative atmosphere that develops very rapidly on a cohesive team. Uh, sometimes you'll see a team, they finish their planning, and they'll start and they'll give each other a high five. And you know instantly that this team is working very quickly towards becoming cohesive. Problems are often worked out in advance of implementation. Or when they aren't worked out in advance of implementation, with a cohesive team, they're willing to stop and rethink what they're doing, and they're willing to all feel free to kind of say what they think ought to happen here. 
And so there's much more uh, a democratic process that's used in making decisions. And the feeling of consensus uh, permeates this type of a team a lot more. Conflict is addressed, or disagreement is addressed, and, and it's worked through as it arises. So if someone disagrees with what's being done, they're free to say it. A lot of times uh, into this exercise, you'll, you'll be doing jungle escape, and someone will say, oh, no, 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 don't do it that way. You know, that's going to slow us down if we do it that way. Let's do it this way. And it sounds like it's pretty argumentative, but uh, yet the team thinks of it as a very healthy way to disagree and to work with each other. Team members often feel more excited, committed, and involved in the projects that they're working on when you have this cohesion. And they're much more satisfied with their team efforts. So these are the three types of teams, fragmented, divergent, and cohesive. Now, some of, the, uh, some of the elements of effective teamwork help them become more cohesive. And there are nine elements we're going to look at here. Uh, these I, uh, nine elements we're going to look at one at a time, and we're going to start with the cooperative and supportive climate and go down all the way through task satisfaction. So let's look at the first element, climate. In climate, there is, for a cohesive team, a much more cooperative and supportive climate. There's a sense of urgency and interest in the project versus I'll see on a fragmented team a lot of defensiveness. And people will excuse themselves for it and say, well, I don't mean to upset anyone's feelings, but here's what I think we might do. And uh, so the climate doesn't feel real encouraging and supportive on a fragmented team. The involvement is different on a cohesive team. That is, members make the best use of unique skills, or they jump in to do what they feel like they can do best. Uh, there is a much more feeling and, and actual productivity uh, and satisfaction on the team. And so they feel like they're being productive, and they feel more satisfaction because they feel like they're accomplishing something on a cohesive team. A lot of times on a, either a divergent team or a, a fragmented team, you'll see that frustration set in very early. Now, that's not to say a cohesive team doesn't get frustrated. Uh, I've seen some cohesive teams that get near the end and are having trouble putting the final body of the copter together, and they'll have some frustration that they're not able to just uh, get it done quickly, but, uh, but it's a healthy type of frustration that all members will jump in and work together on getting it done. The leadership in a cohesive team rotates based upon skills, abilities, and motivations that are needed at that point in whatever the project is. And the leadership is, uh, uh, is able to help each other complete tasks. And it's, uh, it's also uh, helping encourage effective collaboration with each other. Now what happens on a fragmented team is you'll see the one person take charge mentality. And to some extent on a fragmented team, it feels good early on that one person takes charge but then it sort of becomes annoying on a fragmented team that this person is still doing a lot of directing when people don't feel like they need the direction as much. <clears throat> and like I said, the leadership on a divergent team is often very frustrating because people aren't stepping up to do what they really need to do at an appropriate time. And goal setting. <clears throat> In goal setting, the project's purpose and scope are very clear of what we're doing. And the team sets realistic goals and a shared vision of what they're going to accomplish. <coughs> now, a lot of times, uh, the goal setting that happens on a more fragmented team or a divergent team it, it is not a kind of a common goal of what we're going to accomplish. That is, to build the copter uh, and to work together, sharing pieces and helping each other. But the goal setting is, uh, Bert, you go ahead and you finish the tail of this thing. And Sam, you go ahead and you finish the, uh, you finish the landing gear. And so it's, it's individual goal setting that doesn't bring the team together. Uh, it feels good to have people assigned to not do overlapping or duplicative work. But at the same time, it doesn't feel like there's a common purpose for the team. So those are four elements. Let's go on and now look at some other elements. Uh, a, a fifth element here is problem solving. There is in an effective team, uh, a cohesive team, there is uh, quick acknowledgement of the problem, there is open acknowledgement of it, and there is an agreed upon process for addressing the issues, which is 
that people are feel free to speak up. And so uh, problem solving in a cohesive team feels like we're making progress because people are being open and sharing things. Uh, when you have either a divergent or a uh, fragmented team, you'll often feel like people have personal agendas and the suggestions that they're making to problem solve feel like there is some hidden bias. It doesn't feel like they have the interest of the team when they're trying to, to uh, talk about a problem or a potential solution. In decision making, uh, in a cohesive team, you'll see that each person is providing input and, and supporting team decisions. So this consensus process comes out pretty strong in a cohesive team. And what I've seen sometimes on divergent teams is they'll talk a lot uh, they'll talk a lot, but they're not really feeling like their talk is giving them consensus. It feels like they're going round and around on the same issues, and there's, there's never been a stated agreements, uh, and there's never been agreements that people feel like they can latch on as a goal or a, uh, a mission point at that point. <clears throat> so decision making is much better on a cohesive team. Uh, conflict management, or what I call the freedom to disagree, uh, and a cohesive team is treated as an opportunity, not a problem. Uh, and so a conflict or a disagreement happens, and we're glad that someone surfaces it and talks about it. It sparks the team towards more creative thinking. Uh, and so what will happen in the last 10 minutes of this uh, jungle escape is I'll kind of watch teams and notice how much they uh, people will disagree with each other or correct each other or ask someone to change something they're doing. <coughs> and in a cohesive team, you'll notice there's a lot of that that takes place. Now, at the end of the game, then, I'll ask the question a lot of times, uh, how much disagreement was there on the team? And a lot of times, cohesive teams don't feel like there was any disagreement. When, in fact, there was a lot of disagreement, but it didn't feel like any type of conflict disagreement. It felt like just healthy ideas. It felt like new innovative ways of doing things. And so the conflict management is a way that allows people to feel like they're giving input without hurting anyone's feelings. Communication here, the eighth, eighth element of effective teamwork, is best for a cohesive team that's active listening with each other with appropriate feedback to each other, or responding to each other uh, with uh, their ideas. Uh, and ideas and insights are welcomed and reinforced. One of the things I've seen on some divergent teams that uh, have done jungle escape on communication is someone will state something, and no one really responds to what they state. Other ideas are brought up. So someone will say something like, well, I think if we work on the right side of the body first, we'll be able to complete it quicker. And someone will respond to that with, uh, are we finished with doing the landing gear yet? You know, and, and you sit there and wonder, they're not sort of connecting in and really listening to each other and responding directly to each other. And so a divergent team often has problems with this communication uh, because we're not really tuning in to other people. And finally, we get to task satisfaction. Task satisfaction, I, I think, to some extent, is more a product of what happens than part of the process. But there is a lot of satisfaction in that we're pleased with the efforts and the teamwork, and we enjoy celebrating their success. And the more we feel task satisfaction with the team, each time we have another project, we start on a better, uh, we start on a better place with the team. And so task Building task satisfaction is important to helping the health of a cohesive team stay together well. So those are the nine elements of effective teamwork. Now, let's look at some of the applications. The application of doing Jungle Escape is that there is some action planning at the end of Jungle Escape. And so in this action planning, we ask four basic questions, although there's a few others we sometimes get to. And that is, how does our performance as a team in this activity mirror the way we really work together on the job? Um, and in what way 
do, did I learn something that will help my team work together more effectively in the future? And based upon what I've now learned, what action steps will I recommend my team take on its next project or when we work together? And what personal insights am I taking away from this activity? So each team then reflects critically on these four uh, uh, points, and sometimes we throw in some other points that they reflect on how they did, and it helps them uh, decide how they're going to work together in the future. One of, one of the best uh, examples I've had of action planning that really helped a team was uh, with a pharmaceutical company I worked with some years ago. And the leader of this team, the vice president, his name was Bud. And uh, when I interviewed some of the managers that worked for Bud and directors that worked for Bud, what I found out is uh, Bud was a very controlling person. They, they described the way they worked with Bud is Bud would give them assignment, they would go work on it, or they would have maybe a goal to work on for the year. And Bud would always want to have reviews set up on people's projects. And so they would go to Bud to, to review what they had done, and it might be a group of two or three of them at a time. It might even be an individual at a time. But when they'd go to Bud, Bud would often take the project over himself. Uh, Bud would take the report or take whatever the output of the, pro of the product was. And Bud would do the work on it himself. And he'd put the pieces, he'd reassemble the outline, he would put together his words on it, and his two cents became most of what uh, would happen at the end of the project. Well, it was interesting. I knew this beforehand. So when we started Jungle Escape, I saw Bud sitting back with his arms folded. And I thought, well, that, I didn't expect that. I thought Bud would get more involved in this. Um, but as the project went on, by 15 minutes, Bud was out of his seat, and he was working on different parts of the copter. But when it got to 20 minutes and 22 minutes, all of a sudden Bud had all the pieces himself, and he was doing it all by himself. He wasn't asking for input. He wasn't talking anymore to anybody. Even though people would say things to him, he was ignoring what they were saying, and he was just focused on his building this helicopter. Well, obviously, when the exercise was over, they did finish it, uh, interestingly enough, in about 25 minutes. But when it was over, uh, Pretty quickly, we brought up the fact that Bud sat back at the beginning of this, but by the end of this uh, 25 minutes, he was controlling the whole thing. And, and people started talking about how that really is like Bud. Bud is still like Bud during this exercise. And so his natural behavior really came up. His natural behavior was not to be involved in a project at the beginning of it. But when it came to the completion stage of a project, he wanted to be in control of that part of the project. And so people discussed how frustrated they were with that, or uh, how, how frustrated they often were that he sat back at the beginning and would never give his input into what he expected, but that at the end of the project, he then had all these corrections he wanted to make. And so it became a rather lengthy debate uh, debriefing session while people were giving Bud their feedback about their frustration about it. And Bud was talking about just his natural way of working. And, and I do believe that that probably was Bud's natural way of working, that he, that he liked to uh, not get involved in details early on in the project, but he did have a sense of completion he liked uh, and wanted to complete projects that way. And I use that example because a lot of teams can see natural behavior come out during jungle escape. And that natural behavior, when reflected on and analyzed, helps the team understand some of their natural work process. So you probably are asking the question now, well, what changed then after this session? What changed after this session is a much more healthy, open communication with Bud about these type of things. And so people knew that early on they ought to go to Bud to get some input if they were feeling frustrated about not having Bud's input. And Bud understood at the end of this project that he shouldn't just take the project on all by himself, but work in partnership with the people who had been working on the project 
in order to complete the project. And when I talked to some members of the team some months after this, uh, they said things had gotten much better with Bud and working with Bud and understanding Bud and Bud understanding them. So that's the type of learning that comes out from a team. Now let's discuss something else that Jungle Escape helps show, and that's about planning and the fact that planning does make a difference. Um, here are some planning guidelines we reflect on at the end of Jungle Escape. Uh, we go back to look at uh, these kind of guidelines to help plans uh, be a little stronger. Uh, first of all, to understand the task and what is to be accomplished is something that the team needs to plan around and, and understand uh, what, what has to get done in this project. And to assess some team members' experience and their skill and where they might fit into this project the best. To define some time frames or schedules and what we ought to work on first or what we ought to work on in the middle of this project or toward the end. To understand each person's role and responsibilities, what they, they need to do. To surface and identify some problems that might occur. Uh, I like to, to say the best planning question in the world is, well, what's going to be so tough about this? Because if you look at what's really tough about building this helicopter, it's not the rotor, it's not the tail, and it's not the landing gear. It's building the body of the helicopter that frustrates everybody. And so if we understand that that's the hardest part, we would start on that part first. We would start because we know that that's going to take the longest. And, and that's the biggest problem that the team's going to have. Also, we need to determine who coordinates some team efforts uh, and who's going to do what part of just helping guide the team complete the project, and then establish some measurement for the work. So these planning things are discussed after they do Jungle Escape because usually the planning that's done for Jungle Escape is simple ones like, uh, Bob, why don't you just go up and you do the looking at the model and bring us back communication about it. And, um, and like I said, we often uh, on each team fragment ourselves by dividing up the parts of the helicopter that each person is going to work on. So uh, uh, the most interesting example I ever saw, and I guess what made me a real believer in planning, was a team I worked with some years ago with a chemical company. Uh, this team had 12 people on the team and they were part of a redesign team, a cross-functional redesign team, and they were from various functions throughout the chemical company. And uh, they were going to redesign the organization. Um, they had been working together for one year and making progress on what they were doing. Now, they came, though, to me and said, you know, we need a, re we need a, a retreat. We've been together for a year. We need to just examine how we're working together. And so part of that day, we put in uh, Jungle Escape. And what I decided to do is divide that 12-person team into two teams of six, give them both a helicopter, and ask them to build their copter and survive. Well, I handed out the helicopters, and both teams started their planning. They hadn't planned more than about 30 seconds uh, to maybe, uh, maybe less than a minute. And one of the managers in the group stood up and called out to the team on the other side of the room, hey, the purpose of this retreat is to get us working well as one total group. I think the two tables here ought to be working together. And I think we ought to move our tables together and just somehow plan this whole thing out together. And the people at the other table turned and fell, said, oh, you just think you're going to lose. You think we're going to build our helicopter faster than you're going to, and you're going to be embarrassed by it. And that's the only reason you want us to work together. He said, no, I'm serious. I think that what we're trying to accomplish today is to make sure we have examined everything we can do to work more cohesively together and to work better together. So I, I propose we put our tables together and plan. And the other team said, okay, let's do it. Let's try it. They moved the two tables together and had the two pieces side by side. And I thought, what's going to happen now? Well, they went into their planning and planned out how they would do this in a very efficient and effective way. 
and they spent six minutes in planning. Let me tell you, that's rare. Uh, most teams spend between a minute to two minutes to plan. So when they got the six minutes of planning and said, okay, we're ready to start, I thought, holy cow, this is incredible that they've spent this much time. How in the world are they going to do on building this thing? And what they had done is they had established clear roles for people. They had understood that building the body of the copter is the hardest part uh, without my having to tell them that. They, they discovered that on their own and thinking this through. And so they laid out four sides to the helicopter immediately and first built the four sides, uh, two on one table, two on the other table. And uh, they actually completed the two helicopters in six minutes. I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe that they could do it so quickly because I'd never seen a team complete it in less than 12 minutes before. Uh, and, and what had happened is they had planned out things extremely well uh, by working together, by getting all input, by thinking through how the, the process could be streamlined. Of course, they were a re-engineering team, and uh, you know they could figure out how to engineer even putting together a copter. Uh, so, but it convinced me that there are lessons to learn in how we plan and how we can plan better. And I saw from that team the type of in-depth questions and difficult questions that were asked in their planning that really helped them build that helicopter extremely efficiently. And of course, they were thrilled when I told them six minutes is the fastest I had ever seen that copter built. So here are some of the applications. Now, I think there are two levels of applications here. One is for the team development and the education they get. And in the team development, we've seen some of this. They understand how to move from more fragmented to more cohesive. And most teams come out of it with understanding something they've done that fragmented them and didn't open them up to each other. Uh, they also have, are able to determine which of the nine elements need improvement. Sometimes it's only a couple of the elements that they need to work on. Sometimes it's quite a few of the elements. But uh, they do an assessment of those nine elements after they've uh, built the helicopter. And they look at what they can do on the job to improve those nine elements. They learn to appreciate each person's style of working. And people will work differently on this copter and provide different types of input. And you learn to appreciate some people that maybe you, you wondered why they were just kind of off doing their thing. And maybe they had some abilities that uh, the team needs. And then one of the biggest outcomes is this defining future actions the team needs for their development. And, and to decide on a charter of things the team is going to do to develop. So those are some of the team development things. And let's look now at the individual development that's needed. The individual development is often uh, particularly comparing the activity interaction that uh, they've had to on-the-job behavior. It, it's sort of like the bud story. It, it's seeing how different people work and understanding that and appreciating that a little bit better. And then there's some action planning of my responsibility for team improvement, because each person needs to do something to improve the total team. Uh, and and in, uh, in, for instance, the Bud story I told you, each one in that room, there were, there were eight people on that team, all eight people realized they had some compliance that they had to do in order to make this work better. There's a lot of insight into how their own team can work better together. And there are some personal insights into the how I work on this team. Um, and an understanding about what I need to do to improve my team interaction. So those are, those are what I call the team development learning, the individual development learnings that each uh, person takes away from this when they're done. Now, there are some variations to Jungle Escape, and some of the simulations you might be using out there, you might do some of these same type of variations. For instance, in, in the team version of, of having an intact work team or a cross-functional team work together, one organization I worked with uh, in using the team version had around 100 and some odd people, 
And one of the things they wanted to do is because some people were at different sites and uh, didn't really work closely together with anybody, they wanted to bring in people from different departments to work together at the same time. So uh, we, we took that, uh, I think it was like 120 people, uh, we took that, divided it into six sessions of about 20 each, uh, and mixed up the team so that they could get to meet people from other parts of the organization, understand how they work, uh, understand some more, and the feedback that they got at the end was a little bit more of how I see my team working back on site that relates to Jungle Escape. And so it became a great experience to build sort of a one-team mentality with uh, all 120 people. Uh, an inter-team version is available uh, on Jungle Escape. And the inter-team means one department who has to work with another department. Often there's a department that we might be serving or we might be providing information for or we might be uh, working with in some way that we need to work better with. And so we have a version of Jungle Escape that's great for getting both departments together and having them work in some way to realize the dependence that they have on each other. Uh, Jungle Escape works great in leadership training. Uh, you, I, I've often brought leaders in, done Jungle Escape, and then had a lot of lessons on what they can do to develop their own team back at the work site. And so in, uh, in leadership training, uh, what happens is uh, the, the people just are, are learning together and they get to compare what some of the nine elements are that their own teams need to improve on. And then uh, Jungle Escape also works, of course, great for a retreat or an off-site for an intact work team uh, or maybe a cross-functional team that, that is working on a project. Um, I've even used it with some uh, ongoing project teams. Uh, and, and with the ongoing project teams, uh, they often have some learning then about how they work together. And so there are a lot of different variations and uh, ways you can take Jungle Escape and apply it to different situations. Um, so, Sarah, I've done a lot of talking here. Hope I haven't talked too fast. I hope I haven't lost anybody. But I'm just wondering what kind of questions have come in or what kind of questions can I answer for you before uh, the monsoon is going to hit here in a few minutes. <laughs> Great job, Gary. Great job. Thank you so much. We do have a number of questions that have come in. They're really good questions. So let's go ahead and start off because we do have time for questions. Um, feel okay. free to keep sending in your questions. Um, those that are on the line, you can type them right into your chat box there, and uh, I'll go ahead and ask them to Gary. Um, so go ahead and keep sending those in as we go through our Q&A portion right now. So our first question is from Rosie. And Rosie asks, is there a minimum or even maximum number of participants you feel is appropriate for this exercise? I've done the exercise with four people, uh, and it worked very well. It was an intact work team, uh, four people, and it worked very well. I don't know if below four it would work real well, uh, but it might. It might work with three. Um, a maximum is interesting because how big can it go? Pretty big. I, uh, for the Home Mortgage Association of America, I did a session with about 200 participants. And I know a colleague of mine in Houston uh, for a pharmaceutical company, I think he did about 500 people at one time. Now, if you have an extremely large group like that, you're going to have to train some assistant facilitators to help you. They, they'll help hand out the kits, kind of monitor what's going on, help answer questions because questions do come up. Uh, throughout the activity. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'd say anywhere from four to 4,000 maybe. Great. And you know what? We, we have a, um, a follow-up question to that, um, and this is from Patrick. And he is asking, when you have a large group like that and you divide it into smaller groups, do you have those smaller groups build the helicopter in the same room or do you separate them? I've always done it in the same room. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure. That, that's a good question, Patrick. But I am not sure if uh, if you'd have much advantage in, in doing it in different rooms. Part of the reason I do, like it the same room is there's some excitement that happens and some competitiveness 
of seeing how other people are doing it and some learning and seeing how other people are doing it. Uh, and, and in the debrief, you can see sometimes that certain teams did work better together and why they worked better together. And so, um, you know, I really lean towards uh, having uh, everyone in the same room. And that, that's probably my personal bias because I think there's a lot of learning in observing what other people are doing while you're building it. And what about the individual team size? Um, so, you, you know, you have, you've talked about now your classroom size. What about those individual teams at your tabletops? I like four to eight. Um, I had tried it one time with ten people, and there is a natural kind of uh, uh, fragmentation that occurs, a lot of fragmentation when you get up to ten people. It's very hard for them to really work well together on this intense of an exercise where there's a lot of, there has to be a lot of focus that, that pulls together near the end of it. And it was very hard for a team of ten people to do that. Uh, I've done some other types of exercises, too, where I have found that teams over eight people are less successful. Uh, I have done some of the survival exercises where I found that teams of nine or more uh, had much lower scores on the survival score uh, than teams that were eight and less. So I, I guess that's another one of my personal preferences. Great. And, and still, we have a number of questions coming in around the same thing, so I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. But they're asking about the creation of the teams. Um, do you, as a trainer, then handpick people who are on the teams, or do you, you know, assort numbers, or what type of um, team setup do you have? Okay, that's another great question uh, and a hard one to answer. But uh, in, in a lot of places where I do this, we're trying to build an intact work team. And so the rule of thumb I often use is, who works together? You know, which people on this team really are working together on things? And so, for instance, that example I gave of the chemical company that had 12 people on it, I had asked the manager, if you divided this out, tell me which people work most with which other people. And he had done that, and that's how I ended up dividing it into two groups of six. Now, um, not everyone has that purpose. Like I told you, that that organization of 120 people, it was a division of a major company. The purpose instead changed. There was a lot of purpose of getting people to understand and appreciate people in other parts of the organization. And so it purposely was randomized. And, and we purposely made it so that people who got on the same table had never met each other uh, or would not have had much of a reason for having met each other. And, and so there was a whole different goal that the, uh, the vice president of that group wanted for his team, which was to get people to appreciate people in other parts of the organization. I hope that answers that. If not, uh, send another question on, and I'll do it after the webinar is over. Great. Now, now training, changing a little bit our focus here to um, your reference story that you gave uh, around Bud, um, our, yes. our manager who really liked to be involved. We have a couple questions coming in on on the when you have participants who are the opposite of that personality. They either uh, want to be a solo act, they um, either don't want to participate for whatever reason. How do you get them motivated, and how do you get them to contribute to the activity? That's a good question, Sarah, because generally most people start getting into this activity after a little bit. Uh, even on those pictures you showed, I took those pictures early on of the session I had, and you'll see a few people sitting down. But rarely, rarely will I ever do this where after about 10 minutes people are still sitting and not actively standing up and, and taking pieces and moving pieces and going to look at the model or doing something that's helpful. Um, I, and especially if you have your teams both six people or below, everyone feels some more ownership and responsibility to get the helicopter built. And especially the more you build this competitiveness between teams in the room, if uh, you have five teams in the room and one team's yelling out, we're going to win. We're going to win. Well, everyone else kicks in in the room, and they start taking uh, some ownership for their team winning. But, you know, let me answer just one other piece of that, which is 
yes, there are some people who d do sit back a little bit more. That's part of their natural preference and their natural style. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things I like to do with Jungle Escape is use an instrument that looks at people's personal style, uh, like the What's My Team Member style that HRDQ has works really well with Jungle Escape. The other one that works amazingly well is the uh, Teamwork and Team Roles instrument because uh, in that instrument it identifies what people are initiators, what people are ideators, elaborators, and what people are completers. And you'll see that some people maybe sit at the beginning uh, until they get an idea about what is really going on here. And then they're, they, because they're completers, they really kick in a lot stronger near the end of the activity. Great. Thank you, Gary. We have a user on the line, David, and he um, actually has the facilitator guide and has a question here about observers. Um, what suggestions do you have so the observer doesn't feel left out if they want to help in building the model? Yeah, David, that's a great question. I'll tell you, I'm, uh, I'm leaning more and more towards not having an observer uh, for most groups. That uh, If I have uh, 15 people or less in the room, I usually don't even have an observer. I do the observing because everyone wants to get involved and wants their hands on and wants to, wants to participate. Uh, now, if you have particularly large groups, you know, like uh, when I did uh, uh, for that Home Mortgage Association, did a couple hundred people, you have to have observers that, that observe some of the dynamics that are taking place. Um, and uh, one of the things I often do is have the observer observe for 10 minutes, and so they see some of the initial dynamics, which are probably more important to talk about fragmentation. And then after 10 minutes, I say, okay, all observers can now join in. Uh, and uh, so I have the observers then start after 10 minutes, because by then their fingers are itching to, to start putting together some pieces. Thanks for that question, David. And our uh, next question here is from Lynn. Um, she's asking specifically around the time frame. Um, would you recommend the entire process of building, debriefing, applying to real-time behaviors, action planning, and, and et cetera? Um, what kind of time, time frame are you allowing for that? Well, um, you know, that it's a little bit like an accordion. It, it depends on what you really need in the session. I have a lot of people that say to me right now, they say, Gary, I, I can't afford more than one hour for something like this. And so we do things that push it shorter or quicker. Uh, for instance, one of the things, rules that I have sometimes eliminated that says only one person can view the model at a time, I eliminate that because it will actually make the time speed up a lot faster and they'll complete it a lot faster. Um, so there are things you can do to speed up parts. Uh, my personal preference is that a good debrief is worth whatever time it takes. If the team becomes open about how they really worked on this and what different people did, and, and they're getting honest with each other, you know, I like to see that go on and on. I don't like to see this uh, 30 minutes of actually building the helicopter go on and on. Uh, sometimes the team won't be done in 30 minutes and they'll say, oh, give us another five or give us another, another 10 minutes. But the lessons have been learned about this team. Uh, and they're, the only thing another five or ten minutes is going to accomplish with that team is they're going to complete the helicopter and feel good about completing it late. You know, so, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the biggest learning is in the debrief. And uh, so that's the, that's the most valuable time of the whole activity. And how much then in a training session would you would you allot for um, you know for the full activity if you if you could have the pick of whatever it is you you know you can do? If I had the pick of whatever I could do, knowing that people's time is worth money, I would say 90 minutes to maybe 115 minutes is uh, is a great time frame to really get into it and learn a lot out of it. Great. Okay, and then, then our uh, last question, um, we, have, we have time probably for, for two more questions here. Um, our, our second to last one here that has come in is from Aaron. Um, and Aaron asks around um, 
if clients consider the game childish, say you have some um, you know, stuffy employees or employees that are not used to uh, running games or activities, do you ever get any feedback uh, um, you know, around that nature? You know, uh, like I mentioned, uh, Bud was a vice president. I have done this with a lot of uh, executives and organizations who really get into the game and learn a lot out of the game. Um, so I think a lot of senior people uh, enjoy playing the game, and especially if you let them know at the beginning there are some lessons learned about how people work together and to play that little tape in the back of their head about how they are working together as a team. Um, I have found that uh, senior people really love it. Um, and in terms of being childish, uh, a lot of it depends upon your debrief. Uh, it depends upon, well, it depends upon two things maybe. One is the ob observations that are made. Do you really good, get good observations about this team uh, that you can give feedback to the team about? Do you really see things that are going on? And then secondly, in the debrief then, are those things really illustrated and uh, are the, the learning points really made valuable uh, for the team? Great. Thank you so much, Gary. And so now our last question here that we have time for. Well, you got tough questions, Sarah. I know. I know. <laughs> we had a lot come in. It's wonderful. Our last one that has come in is from Cheryl. And she asks, have you ever seen Jungle Escape fail? Oh, wow. That's another good one. Yeah. You know, I'm inclined to say right away no. But, you know, when I first started doing Jungle Escape almost 20 years ago, I had a group of government workers in Washington, D.C., and uh, we had six teams of about five on a team, and we went through the 30 minutes, and there were four of the teams not even finished yet. But they had all worked very fragmented, you know, very independently on it, and, and there wasn't any cohesion really being built with the teams. And my, you know, as a younger trainer, and not to experience with Jungle Escape, I thought, oh, no, this is a failure. Oh, because they're feeling so bad that they didn't get it done. But again, in the debrief, there were a lot of things brought out about what they could have done or how they could have worked. And so, yeah, it failed in terms of four of the, out of the six teams did not get Jungle Escape put together. But at the same time, all six teams had a heck of a lot of learning about what they could do to work better as a team. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, no, it really didn't, the learning didn't fail, even though they did not get their helicopters put together. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gary. And, and thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. Feel free to keep submitting your questions to us. Um, and Gary will respond to those directly by email afterwards. And as an exclusive offer, um, you do get 20% off of any Jungle Escape product that you purchase on our website, and that's hrdq.com. Make sure you use the coupon code. It's J-E-Webcast, um, and it's all, all put together, no spaces. We do appreciate your time, and we hope you found today's webcast informative.